My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. I'm Jennifer Conley. Today's leadership quote is from the Buddha. The mind is everything. What you think you become. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. And here's your host, my data. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Jennifer Connolly. Jennifer is Director of Operations at Rally Day Partners in Denver, Colorado. Jennifer, how's it going? Very good. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Yeah. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and how you ended up in the EA profession earlier in your career? Yeah, I grew up in Colorado Springs, and when I was in high school, I opted not to go to college, and instead of going to college, I sent letters all around the country asking for an internship. I really, really thought that my life passion and dream was to be a fashion designer, and so I was asking for fashion design internships all over the country, and I ended up getting uh, an internship in Nashville, Tennessee, that's Nashville with an N, um, with a designer named Jeff Garner, who at that time ran a company called Prophetic, uh, which was a streetwear design company. And I interned for a year before bring, being brought on as an executive assistant at that company. Nice. So did you, once you got into the EA role, did you kind of realize that that was more aligned with what you wanted to do versus the fashion stuff or how to tell, tell us about that. Cause you said you wanted to get into fashion and then next thing you know, you're an EA. Yeah. So I worked for, um, a gentleman, Jeff Garner, and he is one of those visionary leaders who was a very talented designer. And I think that when you come across someone like that, you realize everyone has a complimentary skill set, And for me, uh, there was no room to be a designer because there already was one. And I really got to learn all about the other side of the business world, um, whether that's manufacturing process, accounting cycles, sales, um, investor relations, all of the above. And that's really where I excelled. Uh, I never really designed anything that sold, but I really got my feet wet as far as what it meant to be on the operation side of a company and learned that my true talent really was not in design, but really in um, business development operations and overall execution of strategy. So that's very similar to kind of how I shifted into the EA profession because I was a musician and I realized um, over time that there were other musicians more talented than myself. And as I started doing the operations and the admin and details and project management and stuff, I realized that I was actually better than everybody else at this type of work. And that kind of shifted. But it, at first it was like a little sad because I was like, I wanted to be this like, you know, famous musician that, you know, had a record that sold a lot of copies and whatever. So did you have any of that when you, when you kind of realize that the design or the fashion stuff, um, might not be your career. Absolutely. It is. It's, it's a really strange realization and more of like an acceptance process that you get to with that. And, um, for me, one of the outlets that I held on to for a really long time, probably 10 years is I did a lot of fashion styling as my creative outlet, because I think that, you know, we're, we're humans and we're very complex. And while we're very good at business and operations, we're still creative and we have have a creative need. And so for me, I filled that um, with styling music videos, much, mostly for Christian and country artists um, for a period of 10 years. Um, but it was one of those double-edged swords where you, you really just get to learn what you're good at. And it doesn't mean that you're not skilled at other things, but it's more about understanding that you're better at some things than others. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, what tell us about? I'm just curious. Tell us about the styling of the music videos. Like, what does that entail? Oh, it's super fun. It is like any young girl or boy, whoever grew up dressing their Barbies and like making them have little scenarios that they play out. It's just like that. And so you get to shop the most high end designer clothing collections before they're even seen by anyone. And then you have these racks and racks of clothing that are just amazingly designed. And then usually this is a very generalization. So I apologize if this offends anyone, but Usually you get a set of musicians, mostly for me it was a lot of bands, a lot of male bands, and they come in usually wearing clothes that they've had on for two days and they haven't showered and they don't really care what you put on them and it's this amazing blank canvas and you get to put together this collection of clothing that is really ultimately a vibe that they want to put out, a vibration, a style, a look, a feel that that to them exemplifies their music and their style from a musician's perspective. And, and really what I learned from the experience is that that's what fashion is, is that every day we all get to decide what to wear and what to put on. And we all decide what vibration do we put out? Are we powerful? Are we submissive? Are we bright and cheery? Are we dark and stormy? Do we give a come here or a stay away vibe? And, that is something that was so powerful is learning to tell a story from clothing was such a good education for me from a business perspective, because I think we all do that with our clothing. We do it with our communication. We do it with the way we interact with other people. Is that personal branding action that you have? So was there any um, funny, awkward, embarrassing moments um, during that that time or do you or even just is there a music video that maybe uh, people or was more popular that you worked on that people might recognize the artist? I have a really funny story. Um, anyone who's a fashion buff, I'll drop a name. Uh, Cara Delevingne. I was very lucky enough to style her very first runway show. And um, she wore this red dress as the grand finale in our show. And uh, gosh, I can't even remember what year it was, but it was a eco show in London. And she had been about 16 years old. And the funny part about it is that I dragged 150 pounds of equestrian boots from the United States to London. And um, there's all these really tall models and none of them fit the boots that I brought. They were all had much bigger feet. So I ended up going out in London and pulling all these old used horse riding boots from all these old vintage stores big enough for the models to wear. And we, we get to show day and this car delving comes from a very famous family. Now this is her first show, but it was a big deal that she was in it. And so everything was high pressure and she didn't fit in any of the boots that we brought. And so backstage we were like doing the quick change and models are running everywhere. And like the hardest part is getting the boots off of these girls they are sweaty. They're nervous. The boots are too tight and we can barely pull them off. And at the end of the show is like Cara Delvin, our, our superstar girl. And, and she just like, doesn't have time to put the right boots on. They're all too small. So the designer, Jeff Garner literally takes his own riding boots off of his feet, gives them to Cara Delvin, walks down the runway with her wearing his boots. And it was one of those moments that like, that is what an assistant is, is that you run around making all this stuff happen. And at the end of the day, you get zero credit, but it's all about making that moment happen for your boss, your brand, your company, whoever that is. And for me, like that was an experience in like no credit, but all the pride in the world. You know, I just felt so, so proud of that moment. And and as my career went on and like I had no idea who she was at the time, it, it's a photo and a memory and a point and a reference of time of of the t- caliber of person I was working with and working for that we all just did what we could to make it happen. And I think that happens a lot in an assistant's life cycle is that you sacrifice everything to make that moment for other people happen. Hmm. Yeah, it's well put. So, OK, so. Let's talk then about your EA career and then kind of the trajectory you've had where uh, you went from EA to chief of staff, and then now you're director of operations. And I know a lot of, um, so, well, first let's just tell us about your journey and then we'll get into, you know, there's, I know there's a lot of my listeners who aspire to 
kind of take on a chief of staff role, or maybe they they do have aspirations of being a director of operations. Um, so we can get into what you would uh, encourage them with, but let's just tell us about your your um, role shifting throughout your career and um, how that all worked and the pros and cons and all that fun stuff. Great question. Yeah, so I, like I said, I, I graduated high school, sent out letters, I worked for a designer, Jeff Garner, in Nashville, and I had this crazy wild ride of about four and a half years where I was traveling the world and learning all these things about the fashion industry. And then 2008 happened, and no one was buying $50 t-shirts anymore. And my whole world changed really quickly because my position was no longer needed or necessary or even affordable. And so I had to, to, to really swallow my pride and my dreams and, and take stock, first of all, about what I'm good at and what I want. And that's where I started. And what I'm really good at was operations. And what I really wanted in life is to not feel the way I felt when my job ended ever again. And, you know, like that's, you know, I think unattainable because you don't have control of things, but it was a trajectory for me. And so I found myself very, very, very open to finding a job that paid my bills and also served my skill set. And I went to Florida and I worked for a woman that had apothecaries um, at that time in several places around Florida. And I loved my interview. And I, I hope someone else relates to this as I showed up to the interview. This woman had paper files. She had a paper inventory system. She had no social media. It was such an easy win. I went in there, I worked with her for a few years and changed her whole life from analog to digital. And for me, it was like very easy and simple and like, you know, seemed like common sense. But for somebody who's never used email, it was terrifying. So it was a really good kind of midpoint for my career. And and I love the South, but I grew up in Colorado. And I know, Jeremy, you've been here before. Your brother's here in Denver. And it's just a different lifestyle here. And I really wanted to come back home. And so I, I did everything I could. I applied everywhere. I interviewed, I interviewed, I interviewed. And I ended up getting hired at an investment group. And I knew, I knew nothing about financial services or investments or private equity or anything like that. And, and really, um, I think it's life is a bit of, you know, opportunity meets luck for preparation. And this is a very young investment group and they didn't have much systems or processes and they were digital, not analog, but it was a good opportunity for me to really highlight what I could bring to the table, my value proposition. How can I make your company better by hiring me? And they did, they hired me. I moved back to Denver. Uh, I actually, on a side note, personally, I moved next door to what is now my husband. We happen to be next door neighbors on the same street. And it was all because of this decision to take a chance, make a move and do what I felt was best for me. Um, I worked for that company and until they, they actually decided to close their operations. And I was hired on at a very prestigious um, real estate development firm in Denver called Continuum Partners. And that really was how I went from fashion into kind of more financial services investments and it changed my life. It um, it was really a, an opportunity to hone what I'm good at, to create some confidence in my skill set, but also enough for me to know that I would want more for my life than just that role. Um, so it was a really good training ground for me. And once I got to continue in partners, I my title, it's funny because titles are so arbitrary and I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit later, but my title was private wealth manager, meaning that I managed the wealth of the partners. I handled their family office, paid their bills, sent their kids allowance, um, cash management. And I had a slash, what I think, I think a lot of people in this world have. You have a slash title. So you're this and you're that. So I was a private wealth manager and an executive assistant. And so I got to to really dive deep into these partners' financials, but also I supported them on a business level. So I managed their calendars and their travel and who spoke to them and what deliverables they had. And I told them what was important. And, and for me and how I operate, 
that slash in my title was like disconcerting and it was uncomfortable and I didn't like having a slash. I didn't like the split in that. I wanted to be more focused and, and have more of a clear vision of what my role was. And so I had this crazy experience and I, I hope that everyone that's listening has this in their life is I had, um, I had a recruiter come and knock on my door and poach me away and that never, ever had happened to me before. I was always one on the hunt. I was always interviewing, always sending resumes, always looking, 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 looking for the next opportunity. And at this point, I wasn't. I was very content and happy at Continuum Partners. It was a great job, a great learning experience. Maybe that slash bothered me a little bit in the back of my mind, but not enough to go looking. I wasn't looking. I wasn't interviewing. I wasn't sending my resume. And this woman, uh, her name is Halani Ellis, and she runs Executive Admins. So if you're looking for a job, I highly recommend looking her up. She found me. She poached me, and uh, she was she was so clever. Or th- she thought she was so clever. I love you, Halani, but uh, she said she had a confidential client who was looking for someone, and she was so crafty about it that it got my interest, and I went to a lunch with her, and I spent an hour with her, and I guessed who it was by the end of lunch. I knew who it was uh, just because I know Denver folks and they're elite. And I guessed who it was. And after that, I said, yeah, I'll have 30 minutes of coffee with this person. And I did. And I had this coffee and I went in there. And I remember having this conversation with my husband and saying, like, you know, I'm really, really hot. Like, we're good. Everything's fine. Like, everything is comfortable at this moment. I'm going to just go out of curiosity, right? Like, what would this super elite person want with me? And I went to this coffee and it was such a life changer. And I ended up taking a job and I took a job as a chief of staff to a CEO who had never, ever, ever had an assistant. And when I got there, Jeremy, day one, I opened the calendar, cracked that baby open. It is blank. There is nothing on that calendar. So I said to him, I was like, hey, um, like, how do you know where to be? Like, you are really important and in demand. And like, you have 13 direct reports. Like, how do you know where to be at and when? And I was so sad at his response. And he said, very shy and sheepishly, he says, well, people will just text me and and they'll say like, where are you? (laughs) And and I was like, okay, well, this is never ever gonna happen to you again, uh, ever. Like you'll never have that response. And that was really the transition for me from going to that executive assistant role to a chief of staff role. And really that that was a difference in my career. But it really was um, taking stock of what I want, going after it, having someone identify me as a talent and being willing to risk the meeting and take the meeting. And then I decided if I wanted it or not. And I did. So. What would you say, maybe a, what's your like two sentence explanation of the difference between an EA and a chief of staff role? A want to be one. Okay. I think that to back that a little bit up is that I think titles are so arbitrary. There are, there are just as many EAs that are a chief of staff that their company doesn't have a title that fits that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's like, it's, it it really, there's so many different variables. So, you know, it's like, are you in a Fortune 100 company with thousands of employees and a very uh, clear title, um, salary band structure? Or are you in a startup that everybody's just kind of making it up as they go? Like, are you in financial tech? Are you in construction? Are you in, um, you know, retail? It it just really depends on where you're at. So I agree. It's like, it's about what you, what you make of the role and the title really doesn't matter. Um, so I would agree. I would also add that, you know, if, if we want to get real nitty gritty, because I know that a lot of people have this question. So to be more nitty gritty about it is, for me is the definition between being tactical, task oriented, or strategic, meaning you understand the strategy and you are taking all the efforts to execute on that strategy, which could be task-based, but 
it's really, really different between do you understand the overarching executive strategy? Are you executing that? Or are you just checking boxes on a task list? And I think that's a really good way for individuals to decide what side of the fence they lie. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So now, though, you, you went from chief of staff. Now you're actually a different title, director of operations, which is pretty, uh, I don't think that's, uh, you know, shocking that uh, EA slash chief of staff would eventually turn into a director of operations. But what, what was that uh, shift like? Yeah, that's, that's a valid point. I think, um, you know, it's all it's all incremental. So for me, I spent a few years working for a CEO as his chief of staff and lucky for me or unlucky as it was, he was transitioning out of the role. We actually replaced himself with another CEO. So I went through a CEO transition which is, is very uncomfortable if anyone has been through that. It's really tough. So if you've done that, props to you. It's really hard. Um, but it, it really creates a lot of emotional distress for somebody leaving a company that they've been a CEO. It's a lot of, of and, you know, it creates a lot of questions of, like, what's next? What's next? And I was really fortunate that I was a chief of staff to somebody who was a CEO and, 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 and he had a private equity fund and he was a philanthropist and, 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 and so he had all these other needs for me outside of that CEO role and very graciously allowed me to tag along and, and be a part of that journey. And so in part of that soul searching exercise, he, he really found a desire in himself to go back into private equity, which is where he came from. And to do that in a very different way, and we joke a lot about calling it private equity 3.0. First, it started out as 2.0, but now we're 3.0, one year in. And <laughs> and uh, my boss, Ryan Heckman, founded Rally Day Partners with Nancy Phillips, Mark Hopkins, and Travis Conway. And, and they were super gracious and allowed me to be part of their journey as a founder. And and I think that it's it really is one of those situations that – People talk a lot about having a mentor and a mentor is really great and very necessary. And there's somebody who is advising you and helping you to navigate the unseen on your path. But I think a lot of what isn't spoken about is the role of a sponsor. And what I mean by that is somebody who puts their money where their mouth is. And not only do they advise you, but they help you in any way they can, whether that's putting you up for a position or helping you pay for training or a degree or whatever it could possibly be, is somebody who believes in you so much, not only are they willing to give you their recommendation, but also to help you get to that next step. And for me, this is one of those folks, Ryan Heckman is a sponsor of my life, and he he really backed me in any way that he could but also he expected me to deliver. And so it's a 50, 50, someone sets you up and you got to spike the ball down. And for me, that was also a pivotal point that we spent those years together. He knew I had the operational diligence to run a private equity firm, but no one else on the team did. And so it was a lot about giving me the opportunity, the opportunity to prove myself. And he really did that for me. And so in my career, I I always look for those I can sponsor and those I can really volley so they can set and spike it themselves. But that's it. I think that's what life is, is the opportunity to prove yourself. And and it's rare to get that. And when you do, you have to deliver. Yeah. So did you play volleyball in high school? God, I'm only 5'2", so no. I was um, I was more of a gymnast, but if I could have played volleyball, I would have killed it. I just was not tall enough. <laughs> nice. uh, before we get to the next question, so you're, you're in private, private equity. Um, a lot of EAs, myself included, do a lot of work with helping their executives raise money. Yes. <laughs> um, any, any tips on, yeah, how to raise money? I would say uh, raising money tip is this, get a placement agent. If you don't have one, call Pace Note Capital, they'll help you. Uh, I, raising money is a very specialized skill and 
for an EA, it is a nightmare. I'll be really honest. It's really a nightmare because there's so much travel, so much logistics. And and honestly, you're looking for like a 5% success in every meeting. So you spend six months traveling back. I mean, I think you do like 100 meetings in a few months. And... And you're just looking for five that are good. And so no one comes home happy. Everyone's upset. It's a really terrible experience. So if you're in it, get some help, get an expert to help you and, and really just give yourself some praise. You're doing a good job. Yeah. We did, uh, 400, 400 or so meetings in three months, um, during our series B round. So it was fun times. Good Lord. Props to you. That is tough. It is hard. And, and that's just from a scheduling standpoint. Imagine going to those meetings. Well, that's what I was going to say is my CEO like would literally like give the same pitch, uh, same 25 minute pitch um, over and over. I think there was a couple of days in the middle of that that he did like 20 of them in one day. So my God, bless you. Great. Both sides. So hard. So, OK, so then if if. Uh, an EA is listening and they want to do what you said um, when you talked about the difference between being tactical and strategic. Um, maybe they want to be a director of operations uh, someday. Maybe they want to be a chief of staff or they just, you know, again, the title doesn't really matter. They just want to be more strategic. What, what's maybe one or two tips um, that you would give to someone who's trying to transition from tactical to strategic? Really good question. It's hard. I'm going to just start there and give you props for wanting that because it's really difficult being an executive assistant. That assistant part of the title is such a mountain to climb. And it's all about positioning yourself And I'll say, firstly, that starts with you. So getting your own mind right, that you are capable and confident and just as valuable as any other person on your team, that starts with your own thoughts. And then if you have doubts, as I did, uh, you know, I always, always look for opportunities to level up. And I'll give some specific examples is I learned uh, Adobe. I got Adobe certified. I'm not great, but I learned to edit other people's work. I'm not creating things. I can edit other people's things. Um, You know, uh, project management certification is really some steps you can take. Uh, You can take it all the way as far as getting a degree. But for me, it's like have those small steps. Have somebody that you can talk to about that and have encouragement. But any small step you can make is an improvement on your resume and it is all building blocks. And so however you may feel that your team perceives you, that's not your job. Your job is to get better. And it doesn't matter if your team accepts that, the next team will. And you just have to be confident in your ability. And a lot of that comes with education. So I would start first with small steps. Secondly is take an inventory of the assets you already have. Every one of us, here has somebody who believes in us and that is a great place to start you need to start with a sponsor start with somebody who believes in you and really really hone in on what it is that you want and the tiny steps every day that you can get there love it that's great great advice um i like your point about not worrying about other people's perception of you because you can't really control that you just have to to do you and (laughs) you're so right Jeremy I mean if you if you don't have haters you're not doing something right so if you got one hater congratulations (laughs) what if you have a few because uh even better even better Jeremy come on that means that you're doing really good because people don't hate on other people that are not doing well if you're mediocre you're ignored if you're doing good you have a hater so appreciate that and give them some love they're they're also serving a purpose for you yeah yeah kill them with kindness that's how i try to do it (laughs) that's good advice all right so what if your 
listening and someone's listening and they are perfectly content with being an EA. They don't want to be a chief of staff. They don't want to be a director of operations. They just really enjoy the, their role as it is. Is that, um, is that okay? Is that something that, you know, like, cause you know, I, I was in my last role. It was, that was me. I was, I kept getting asked, Hey, you know, do you, what do you, what do you see your career progression looking like? Do you see, you know, you could be a director of operations someday, you could whatever. And it's like, ah, I don't really want that stress. I don't want that pressure. <laughs> like I like my role. Um, but I think there are, I think some people feel maybe ashamed or guilty or like they're not a good EA if they don't strive for more than the tactical EA role. Does that make sense? Totally. And um, I would just highly disagree with that. And if your thoughts are telling you that an EA is just an EA, then that's not the, the response is this is not true because EAs are the most powerful people in this world. And if you are happy being an EA, that means you're happy with yourself and you have more contentment than most people on this earth. So I think it's all arbitrary. The, the titles are, are just so loose. And, and for me, it's like, if you're happy where you are, then you've made it. Congratulations. You know, like that is something to celebrate. And the only, the only thing left for you is to give back. Give your wisdom to somebody else. Give your wisdom and encouragement. Sponsor somebody else. Sponsor that executive assistant or administrative assistant or someone you see along the way that could really use a few words of encouragement each month and help them. Give them tips on how to book appointments more successfully or use Excel more successfully and really share your knowledge because if you're happy doing what you're doing, you are the top 99% of this world and I applaud you. Yeah, that's great. I, I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with being content where you are and not wanting to <laughs> push yourself or, or try something just because other people think that you should, or just because that's kind of, well, that's the career progression and that's, that's what's next. So totally agree. Um, what, what is a resource though? If, if you are like, you know what, I, I want to be a CEO or a COO someday, what's a book or a resource that you recommend to assistants who, who kind of do want to shift into that type of a C-suite role? I have two recommendations. My first is the leader assistant. Um, I'm not sure who wrote that one, but, uh, there <laughs> I, did not, I did not tell you to say that. And I did not tell you, to say that. <laughs> you did not. I've read it, though. So, I will say, if you haven't read Jeremy's book, please do. There are four pillars in there that are so easy to relate to and also to create an action plan around. And you should know where you've come from before you go somewhere. So Leader Assistant is my number one. Um, the second one that I like to plug is an oldie but a goodie. Um, if you really want to be on the C-suite, you need to understand what that means. And you need to understand an organization as a whole – how it operates, um, what the purpose, is it a learning organization, a stagnant organization? There is um, two, two resources by Peter Gage. The first is called the Fifth, the Fifth Discipline. That's five zero, five, Fifth Discipline. And the second part of that is the Fifth Discipline Guidebook. So it's kind of like a how-to and then how you're doing it. Um, it's all about creating a learning, learning organization, which I think is the success of any living, breathing organization that's successful today, but also is, you know, the first, the very first thing, and I know that this is true with all my heart is how do you create a successful organization? The very first thing that you do is you create a shared vision of the organization. What is the purpose of this organization, why do we exist? And it mostly starts with the founder or CEO, but ultimately the COO is responsible for executing the vision as is every other person at the organization. So it's important to know how to create a shared vision before executing upon that. So first of all, start with leader assistant, get to know yourself. Second of all, go to the fifth discipline by Peter Gage and really understand 
what it means to run a company. And it's really hard. It's really difficult. Yeah, that's great advice. I'll, uh, I'll put a link to Peter's book in the, uh, in, in the guidebook in the show notes so people can find that easily. Um, and thanks for the shout out on my book. I appreciate it. Such a good book, Jeremy. Uh, Congrats to you. Just to pause here and be like, damn, damn, good job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, let's wrap it up with uh, one of my favorite questions to ask. What makes an assistant a leader? Oh, God, you open the floodgates here. <laughs> um, so I've been very lucky. And one of the people that I truly admire and follow explicitly daily is his name is Brian Kite. K-I-G-H-T. He has a daily email called The Daily Discipline. And one of his like pillars of his thesis is this, is that there are leaders in all of us and we all lead what's called our 20 square feet. And that is a very arbitrary number, 20 square feet. So if you think about it like this, I'm an assistant. I'm at my desk. I only have my own space to take care of. But at the end of the day, I'm a leader of my own square feet. All of us are leaders, whether we are an executive assistant, a chief of staff, a CEO, maybe we're, we run the front desk or maybe we're out on the field. We all lead. And the truth is what is being a leader? It is the experience of us. We lead that. So how do you interpret me? How clear am I communicating? What is the culture of being around me? All of those things fall into my 20 square feet. And for me, every single day, I own that 20 square feet, whether it's been as an assistant, as a director, hopefully one day as a C-suite executive. I own that, so do you. You get to decide how people feel when they interact with you. It's what you say, it's what you don't say, and it's how you say it. And that's how you're a leader every single day of your own 20 square feet. Mic drop. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Brian Kite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, uh, really appreciate you, Jennifer, uh, sharing your story and being on the show. And is there somewhere online that people can find you or connect with you, reach out and say hi? Guys, I'm on LinkedIn, Jennifer Conley, Rally Day Partners. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to respond. Otherwise, keep doing you lead your 20 square feet. And I hope that at the end of the day, you're content and happy with whatever title that you get. Perfect. Well, thanks again. And, uh, we'll talk soon and I'll put the link uh, to your LinkedIn in the show notes. So thanks so much, Jennifer. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Anything I do to support you, just let me know. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullos.com